home dialysis. Thanks. Perfect. Thanks, Dr. Armath, uh, for the introduction. And uh, it really is comforting, even though it's a big crowd, uh, to be able to recognize so many of the, uh, the names uh, that are here. So thank you for the opportunity to present. Uh, as Dr. Harmat said, my uh, presentation is entitled Home Dialysis is Not Just Equal to PD, uh, and it's meant to be an overview of home hemo. Um, hope you can all hear me and just uh, indicate in the perfect. OK, uh, so no conflicts of interest or uh, disclosures. Uh, here are the objectives that were sent out uh, in advance of the presentation. Uh, so to understand the definitions and epidemiology uh, relating to home hemodialysis, uh, which I'll use home hemo for short uh, for the rest of the presentation, and to discuss some evidence uh, relating to home hemo from provider, patient, and system perspectives. And then finally, to appreciate some of the barriers and challenges to widespread implementation of home hemo and potential solutions. And so I've uh, converted those objectives into uh, this presentation outline that we'll reference uh, throughout. Uh, and so the uh, history of home hemo and the history of dialysis are actually very uh, closely intertwined. And so I thought we could rewind a little bit and talk about some history. The advent of dialysis uh, really began with uh, the first artificial kidney being developed uh, by Kolf in Holland in 1942, and hemo became very much more prevalent uh, for end-stage kidney disease, not until the 1960s. And that was uh, with uh, Scribner and colleagues uh, de developing the uh, Teflon AV shunt uh, and the first outpatient um, dialysis unit in Seattle. And uh, there were early ethical challenges. Uh, this was Dr. Scribner who developed that unit uh, because uh, we had taken a, a disease or a process that was 100% fatal and overnight uh, turned it into 90% survival as per Scribner. And uh, to say that the healthcare system was overwhelmed uh, would be an understatement. And so that really led to a big push uh, towards home hemodialysis. And home hemo was first reported in 1961 in Japan, uh, performed by Dr. Nose uh, with a coil dialyzer. And really in the mid, uh, in the early to mid 1960s, uh, there were several advancements uh, that were made uh, to make uh, home hemo much more prevalent. Uh, and so here was one of the actual machines that, that was used in Seattle in 1964 um, at the University of Washington. And so continuing on, By the early 1970s, with those advances uh, that had been made, 60% um, of patients uh, on dialysis in the UK and 32% uh, in the USA uh, were receiving dialysis at home. And this was mostly overnight hemodialysis. And hospital dialysis really was just accessible only to a very limited number of patients uh, with end stage kidney disease. So, very strikingly different uh, than today. Uh, and there were three main things that happened in the 1970s that led to a big decline of home hemodialysis. Uh, the first was in the US, uh, the passing of the Social Security Act and then the medical care uh, ESRD program in 1972 and 73 uh, that really led to different uh, kind of funding incentives and kind of structural uh, changes in the US uh, for for-profit facilities uh, to be able to deliver in-center hemodialysis as opposed to home. Um, number two was that uh, the invention by Tenkoff et al of the safe uh, closed delivery system for the PD catheter uh, led to wider adoption of PD. And then finally, shifting demographics with increasing comorbidity was also a major contributor. And so with these three things, uh, they were large parts uh, responsible for the decline of home hemo to the point that uh, it had fallen to less than 1% in the US by 2005 and less than 5% in Europe uh, by 1994. So quite a significant fall. And there is a thought that uh, there's actually been some degree of resurgence, uh, perhaps in the last 20 to 25 years. Uh, Dr. Udall at the University of Toronto uh, did show feasibility and safety uh, to slow frequent uh, nocturnal home hemo. Uh, and there is a lot of clinical data that we can talk about uh, later in the presentation. Uh, and there was also development of more patient friendly dialysis equipment, uh, such as the NX stage uh, home hemofiltration, uh, so much more smaller and, and user friendly. Uh, and so talking about international prevalence, uh, here is a, a graph depicting uh, some data uh, from about uh, kind of the early 2010s. Uh, and we can see that uh, the uh, prevalence of home hemo, which is uh, in the light gray, uh, is quite variable. It is quite more uh, widely adopted in Australia and New Zealand, uh, where it's between 10 and 20 percent, and only about uh, 1.3 to 2 percent in the U.S. Canada is depicted here, uh, so you can see that the black on the left uh, of this box is uh, in-center dialysis, and then the darker gray is on the right is peritoneal dialysis, and home hemo is there in the middle. Uh, 
so in the US, uh, the prevalence rate is about 1.9% uh, currently. Uh, and you can see that PD did take uh, quite an increase uh, kind of in the mid 2000s. With regards to Canadian data, uh, we have um, this from the Canadian Organ Replacement Register. Um, and uh, overall, the incident uh, dialysis patients uh, choosing he home hemo would be in the range of only about 0.5% in 2021. If talking about prevalence, it is a little bit higher, with prevalence being at about a range of 4.4%. Uh, and you can see it's depicted by the very top uh, part of the, uh, of the graph there, uh, just the light uh, non-shaded area. Uh, and so the ORN really does have a report that was published uh, for exploring opportunities to grow home dialysis in Ontario. Uh, so this was published in September 2019, and uh, it really set targets to drive growth in home dialysis uh, with a prevalence target of 28%. Uh, and currently, as of about 2020 or 2021, uh, the latest stats are that about 25.8% of uh, dialysis patients are on a home modality. And so here's some data from Ontario stratified by centre. Uh, and again, we can see that the, um, the split between home PD and home hemo are quite variable. So some centres have uh, a much uh, kind of different split uh, than others. Um, so it's very interesting to see how it's uh, split in Ontario. Uh, and here's just uh, that uh, depicted in kind of a uh, collective form. Uh, so we can see that the home hemo prevalence uh, remains fairly stable at about five to 6%, uh, whereas the prevalence of PD has uh, risen uh, fairly consistently up until now. Uh, and so talking about some definitions for uh, home hemodialysis, it really is a, a mixed bag uh, because we have uh, in the modern prescription, a uh, very conventional type of dialysis, which we're familiar with three times a week, four hours per session uh, that patients simply do at home. And so we would be familiar with this type of prescription uh, with the blood flows and the dialysis flows, et cetera. Uh, but there are a variety of other uh, prescriptions that can be uh, used. Uh, this is from a guide published by Dr. Marshall and Dr. Chan um, for uh, implementing uh, hemodialysis in the home. And we can see that there are intermittent forms where we can do every other day for four hours or overnight. Uh, patients can even do short hour daily where they do maybe only two to three hours of dialysis uh, per session, but it happens uh, nearly every day. Uh, or what's uh, more commonly seen is uh, we can do nocturnal home hemodialysis. Uh, so that involves patients doing it at night while they're sleeping, uh, six to eight, eight hours, and they can do it for three times a week, four times a week, five times a week. Uh, and uh, as you can see from the very bottom of the, uh, the table, excuse me, um, that um, those blood flows are considerably lower than uh, we would use for the traditional uh, hemodialysis uh, prescription. Uh, this is just opinion based, so not uh, kind of based on any studies necessarily, um, but um, there is the thought that the traditional nocturnal uh, hemodialysis can really approximate the gold standard, which is transplant uh, with regards to control of volume, phosphate and adequacy. Uh, we'll talk more about some clinical uh, data going forward, but just to really show that um, it's not a homogenous type of prescription when we're talking about home hemo, but really it can be customized according to patient preferences, needs, uh, etc. Um, Peter Blake uh, at uh, Western Ontario published this recently in um, Kidney 360 about uh, the global dialysis resective in Canada and really summarizing that home hemo, as he said, was popular in Canada, uh, perhaps relative to the US uh, where it's, it's much less popular, uh, but it has plateaued at about four to five percent as, as we've shown. Uh, about half of patients are receiving uh, more than three treatments per week and many are doing either short daily or slow nocturnal uh, much more frequently and we'll talk about some data with regards to frequency. And some provinces do have funding formulas uh, for these more intense forms of home hemo. Um, so I do have a section further about economics, but just to say that the ORN uh, does have these modality bundles and home hemo is uh, included in this. And we can talk about this uh, a little bit more as we get into the meat of the presentation. So just some takeaways for this first section would that be that in North America, uh, home hemo has uh, very low incidence rates uh, for new dialysis starts and low prevalence rate overall. Uh, but in Ontario, there is this desire to drive growth in home dialysis uh, with this uh, provincial prevalence target of 28% being set uh, and not yet being met. And uh, there does exist a wide variety of these types of prescriptions that can be customized uh, based on a patient's uh, lifestyle and preferences. Uh, and so with that, we'll go into the next section, uh, which is talking about um, 
home dialysis or home hemo from a provider perspective. Uh, and so for this, I thought we could talk about some clinical evidence uh, that pertains to home hemo. Um, we as nephrologists are all very familiar that um, our patients do have a high burden of uh, cardiovascular disease. It's the leading cause of morbidity and mortality uh, in ESKD. And there is emerging evidence uh, for a more physiologic approach uh, to dialysis being associated with improvement to CV risk factors uh, and outcomes. Um, some uh, putative mechanisms for this would be that the increased duration plus or minus frequency of the hemodialysis sessions uh, could lead to less intradialytic hypotension and other complications. Uh, there could be improvement to chronic fluid overload uh, for these patients, and there could be improvement to removal of uh, uremic solutes and other larger uh, middle molecular weight proteins that we might struggle to get with a traditional uh, three or four hour hemo run. Uh, so most of us would be familiar with uh, the work done by uh, Dr. McIntyre's group at Western to showing that really dialysis uh, does put a lot of stress uh, on uh, the cardiovascular system uh, with regards to uh, demonstrating global longitudinal strain being increased, uh, et cetera. Uh, and myocardial sounding is something that we're, I think, mostly familiar with. Um, there was a six-month uh, non-randomized controlled trial, very small, so just um, patients that uh, were, there was 13 patients in one group, uh, nocturnal hemo patients that were elective switches from conventional hemo, and then 12 control patients who remained on the standard of care, uh, showing uh, that there was improvement to LV structure function and myocardial fibrosis. And um, this was part of the, the data that was from that study. And so they had shown, uh, as depicted in the red boxes, some improvement to LV mass uh, and uh, the mass index as well. Uh, but what about larger trials and a higher quality data? Um, the FHN study, which we will discuss uh, a little bit later, uh, did examine some effects of intensive hemodialysis on ventricular volumes uh, by cardiac MRI. It was a larger study, so there were about 120 patients uh, in each group. Uh, one group was the frequent uh, hemodialysis group doing dialysis six times a week versus three times a week. Uh, and it showed that there was significant reduction to LV and RV and diastolic volumes. Uh, and interestingly, the magnitude of the reduction was accentuated in those who had minimal residual urine output. Um, so that was, uh, that was also a finding. And so it really leads us to think about what is the optimum dose and frequency uh, of uh, hemodialysis. And um, previously, there was the HEMO study that came out in 2004 uh, that had showed that there was no more benefit to more intensive uh, hemodialysis with regards to higher precession QT over V urea. Uh, that's depicted in the, in the graph here, so showing no uh, difference in the standard versus high dose. Uh, however, um, based on that mechanism that solute removal can be dramatically augmented by increasing the frequency of dialysis sessions, uh, that really led to the question of what is actually the optimum dose of uh, hemodialysis with regards to frequency. So this was one of the landmark trials uh, published uh, 13 years ago, the FHM trial. Um, randomizing patients to uh, six times a week in center hemo versus three times a week. Uh, and they were exploring objective and uh, patient reported outcomes. Uh, and so uh, the methods were that they were, it was a multi-center prospective randomized parallel group trial. Um, they had 120 to 125 patients uh, in each group respectively. And results wise, they found that frequent hemodialysis uh, was associated with significant benefits uh, with regards to uh, co-primary composite outcomes. So one of those uh, composite outcomes was uh, death or increase in uh, LV mass. Uh, and they found that the hazard ratio for that was uh, 0.61 in favor of uh, the frequent group. And uh, the hazard ratio for the composite of death or a decrease in the physical health composite sport was 0 0.70. I just emphasize that this is not home hemo uh, that's being compared here, but just frequent. Um, but uh, the, the results are often extrapolated uh, just because it's uh, impractical to do that level of frequency for in-center, whereas it is possible for uh, home. Uh, the authors did find that the frequent uh, hemodialysis group were more likely to undergo interventions for vascular access. Uh, so the hazard ratio was uh, 1.7 for that. Uh, and uh, they had other findings as well uh, that were secondary outcomes. So they found that the frequent hemodialysis group had better control of hypertension and hypophosphatemia, hyperphosphatemia, uh, but they did not find any significant effects on cognitive performance, depression, serum albumin, or ESA use. And so um, Dr. Agurdis, uh, who most of us are familiar with, uh, had published this opinion piece. 
um, just saying that, you know, at the time, the FHN trial results had given some potential guidance on patients who might benefit from more frequent schedules. So those perhaps with increased uh, LVH at baseline or hypertension uh, or low levels of residual kidney function. But it really was a balance uh, because there were some uh, potential increased risks uh, just with regards to vascular access and increased burden and expense uh, to the patients and uh, caregiver. Um, done in parallel with that was uh, the FHN nocturnal trial. Uh, it was a smaller trial, so only 87 patients in total as opposed to 250 patients. Uh, and they randomized patients to six times nocturnal home hemo uh, versus conventional three times a week in center. Uh, they had a primary endpoint that was a composite of mortality, change in LV mass, and then change in that uh, physical health uh, score, the SS36. Uh, they found a non-significant trend towards LV mass reduction in patients with nocturnal, uh, but the study overall was critiqued uh, because they only had 35% of their target sample size, uh, leading to very much underpowering uh, of the study. And so one of the things that they did was um, that uh, they actually had an extension um, post-trial kind of follow-up or observational study. And uh, it was a little bit striking in that they found that in the nocturnal arm, they had an additional 12 deaths uh, in extended follow-up versus the conventional arm had only four deaths in extended follow-up. Uh, so it was a quite controversial finding at the time. Um, and there were many caveats. There were a lot of opinion pieces. One was published uh, in CJSON uh, shortly after this came out. But there were several caveats uh, because, of course, it did seem like a very kind of strong blow against the nocturnal uh, prescription. Uh, so one of the caveats was that the actual prescriptions in the conventional group uh, very much approached uh, what was actually being prescribed in the nocturnal group. So many of these patients were actually receiving uh, greater than 25 uh, hours per week of dialysis. Uh, there were significant center differences. Uh, and so, like, for example, the mortality rate in the U.S. Uh, was at 0.128 deaths per patient year uh, versus in Canada, it was less than half that at uh, 0.055. Uh, and finally, the definition of experience centers for nocturnal hemo was perhaps too uh, generous. Um, they defined centers as experience if they had uh, greater than six or more patients on nocturnal hemo. Uh, and that's thought to be very controversial because most of the patients uh, had, had low numbers of um, patients in, in their centers overall. Uh, and so yeah, this is just referencing uh, much more recently in doctor in uh, 2021, uh, Dr. Polly had published an interesting piece uh, if, if people want to read more about uh, the controversy there. Um, we do have another randomized trial that uh, this one, its primary aim was, was to look at quality of life, but as a corollary, uh, it did look at um, some of these clinical findings as well. Uh, and it randomized 200 uh, adult recipients of uh, maintenance hemo and home-based hemo uh, to either extended or standard treatments. Uh, here are some of the primary data from uh, the study. Um, I just highlighted uh, that uh, they did find significance for uh, the number of BP lowering agents that uh, that, pe uh, that people that patients would need, um, and also improvement to potassium and uh, phosphate. Um, there were some other significant findings, but those are two of the major ones um, from this active trial that was uh, that was recently published. Um, there was a trend towards improvement to BP control, but not uh, reaching statistical significance, and also a trend towards LV mass uh, reduction. Uh, and uh, interestingly, the primary aim of the study, which was to see if there was a difference in quality of life, uh, there, there was no difference uh, in, in that. And finally, we have a meta-analysis here um, that was uh, in AJKD, just looking at um, these cardiovascular parameters and seeing in the conglomeration of the studies, uh, what do we find? Um, and so here's the forest plots of that. Uh, and overall, uh, one of the findings fairly consistently was that uh, the um, uh, extended modalities had uh, reduction in BP and reduction in number of BP meds. And so that really led um, to uh, last year, the uh, American Heart Institute uh, or Association uh, publishing this uh, scientific statement uh, with regards to cardiovascular effects for home dialysis therapies. Uh, they had a pretty big section on uh, home hemo specifically. Uh, this is uh, one of their uh, tables. Um, we've talked about a lot of the primary data that supports this, but uh, reduction in LV mass, LV mass index, uh, and with the summation of studies, so they looked at 30 to 35 studies or so, uh, they did have uh, significance for uh, systolic and diastolic blood pressure lowering. Um, I could talk for hours and hours about so some of the benefits, so to, to be brief about this, um, 
it's been a, there's been association with uh, correction and improvement of OSA as well with nocturnal hemo uh, and improvement to uh, vascular calcification and uh, CV events uh, thought to be because um, uh, because of the improved phosphate and um, uh, phosphate clearance. Uh, so even patients with a liberalized diet, um, so they require many less uh, phosphate binders and better phosphate control uh, overall. And that's thought to improve uh, endothelial vasodilation and uh, baroreflux uh, sensitivity. So what about hard uh, outcomes, hospitalizations, mortality, et cetera? Um, it's really important, of course, to look at surrogate outcomes such as uh, cardiovascular um, um, intermediary findings. But uh, there was a um, study published in AJKD about 10 years ago, uh, looking at hospitalizations for uh, daily home hemo patients uh, versus matched uh, in-center patients. Uh, and uh, it did not actually find uh, that there was a difference. Uh, it was an observational cohort. Uh, they looked at 3,400 uh, home hemo patients versus 17,000 in-center patients. Uh, and the hazard ratio for all cause admission uh, was one. Uh, the cardiovascular disease uh, admission rate uh, was uh, lower at 0.89. Uh, but the hazard ratio for the infection uh, rate was uh, 1.18. Um, so this was, of course, observational data, uh, but interesting to see. Mortality-wise, um, the same authors actually published a matched cohort study uh, using uh, USRDS data um, looking at mortality, and they did find that there was a lower all-cause mortality for the uh, daily home hemo patients with a hazard ratio of 0.87, and a lower cardiovascular mortality rate although not reaching statistical significance. Of course, it has the usual caveats of being uh, an observational study uh, with the possibility of unmeasured confounding, um, but this was uh, a major finding. Uh, and we talked a lot about how Australia and New Zealand have higher uh, prevalence rates uh, of home hemo. And so this was a study uh, looking at a dialysis inception cohort uh, from those two countries, 52,000 patients. And you can see here uh, depicted in the red box, uh, the deaths per 100 patient years, uh, and this is the patients who have uh, or who are on home hemo in black. Uh, there was a lower hazard uh, of death uh, compared to those receiving uh, conventional um, hemodialysis, which is there in the red at the top. Of course, um, I think most of us are, would be familiar. The patients who are having in-center hemo are sicker and more comorbid. Uh, so this is from their uh, their table looking at study characteristics, and we can see that the burden of comorbidity is higher. Uh, so that is always something to be very uh, cognizant of uh, when interpreting uh, this, uh, this level of data, especially when it's observational. Uh, but bottom line, um, I know that was a lot of heavy data and trials, um, but uh, I hope I've demonstrated to some degree that more frequent dialysis uh, is associated with improvements in BP control, less antihypertensive needed, uh, and improvements to these important uh, markers that we do look at, such as phosphate, potassium, LV mass, intradialytic hypotension. Uh, and in large uh, database trials, we see an association uh, with reduced mortality, but uh, mitigated by those caveats as we described. Um, so back to our roadmap, that was uh, thinking about some of the important uh, provider perspectives that we think of. And uh, what about uh, from a system perspective? I, I did want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the economics and uh, funding underlying uh, home hemo. Um, study published by Dr. Phil McFarlane at uh, St. Mike's in Toronto uh, did look at this about 15 years ago now um, and um, reviewed four descriptive uh, costing studies. Uh, so two of these studies were comparing conventional home hemo versus unmatched in-center patients and two were comparing like uh, nocturnal uh, home hemo versus match in center. Um, there was a wide variety of findings, uh, but in general, uh, the, the overall consensus was that uh, home hemodialysis on a yearly basis uh, did have uh, less cost. Uh, so, for example, in one of the studies, it was 36,000 versus 100,000. For the second, it was 34,000 versus 58,000. And that's depicted here as well in the uh, in the graph on the bottom right. Um, there was one of the studies published by Dr. Croker et al. Uh, that did not show uh, a difference. So that would be the far uh, white um, bars. But uh, overall, you can see there's as well a breakdown based on uh, the types of costs. So staffing, dialysis materials, overhead support, uh, et cetera. And so we can see how that breaks down. Um, perhaps even more easily seen, um, uh, graphical form for this was this uh, study uh, published by Dr. Komenda and Dr. Sood uh, about 10 years ago, uh, looking at an economic assessment uh, for home hemo. 
And so they, they broke it up really nicely, uh, looking at the different types of costs uh, that uh, each type of modality can accrue. Uh, so looking at in-center hemo, which are the two uh, bars on the far left, um, we can see that the bulk of the costs are um, really derived from total allied healthcare costs. So that can include nursing, technician, social work, et cetera, as well as the um, consumables, peripheral costs, and the hospital costs. Uh, versus if we look at the far right, uh, the colors are completely different because uh, the main costs relate to patient training, office visits, and evaluation and recruitment. Um, and that's depicted very nicely here in this table. Lots of numbers, so zooming in on this section here, uh, we can see that for year one, um, in-center hemo versus conventional home hemo or frequent home hemo, uh, which are the other two uh, columns, uh, are perhaps comparable, or even the frequent home hemo is more expensive at 51,000 for the first year. But subsequently, uh, in-center hemo has around the same cost. It, it makes sense that it doesn't cost too much more to, or much different to dialyze a patient in year one, two, or three if they're in-center. Uh, but we can see that the cost for um, conventional and frequent home hemo drops significantly because much of the cost, as broken down here in the table, is in that patient evaluation, recruitment, training, and home preparation. So all those costs essentially disappear or are much lower uh, subsequent years. And so there was a uh, report published by Cadiff um, in um, 2017 uh, talking about uh, dialysis modalities for the treatment of ESKD. And um, there was an economic analysis that was done. Uh, so they had a reference case population, which was just incident uh, dialysis patients uh, who would be assumed to be eligible for all um, modality types being considered. Um, and so given this available clinical evidence, uh, their summary was that the least uh, costly modality was conventional home hemo at a cost of 56000 per year and conventional home hemo being the three times a week for four hours uh, that patients would do at home. Uh, they found that other home-based dialysis modalities were, would also be uh, cost-effective compared to in-center hemo, with the exception of assisted PD, which is when the nurses uh, would go into the homes and do much of the connecting and disconnecting of the patients. Uh, and they found that the findings did remain robust uh, despite sensitivity analyses and uh, probabilis probabilistic uh, comparisons. And so. Um, Going back to the ORN bundles, uh, here is the um, funding uh, set out by the ORN uh, as per uh, 2021. Uh, and we can see that the, co the cost for PD uh, is depicted in the far left. Uh, and for home hemo, um, we can see that the cost for training is significant. So 11,400 in the first year, uh, but thereafter, even in the frequent uh, home hemo uh, group where they do four or more sessions uh, per week. Uh, it's at a cost of about 35,000 uh, per year uh, versus uh, for facility dialysis, it's uh, much higher. And if we compare that to frequent facility home, uh, sorry, frequent facility dialysis, uh, where they're doing four or more sessions per week, that comes at a cost of 85,000. So that's quite uh, significant uh, and certainly a consideration that we must take uh, given um, the, uh, the structure of our healthcare system. What about increased uh, cost to patients? So it wouldn't be it wouldn't be uh, very uh, beneficial if we're saving the healthcare system money, but costing our, our patients more. Uh, and there was an interesting study published uh, in a report in 2018 uh, by the Kidney Foundation. Uh, they partnered with uh, social workers to administer a survey uh, to Canadians on dialysis, um, and they found pretty striking um, findings that many Canadians did report a drop in household income as a result of starting dialysis. 50% of new dialysis starts actually had this, uh, and that drop in income was by 40% or more in two thirds of those who had the decreased outcome. So certainly a very uh, significant finding. Uh, and for home hemodialysis in particular, uh, they found that their average out-of-pocket cost for electricity and water for their machine was in the range of 1,100 per year. So certainly a uh, to our patient population. I don't know if I lost. Did you guys lose my slides? Yeah, no, we lost you for a second there, but we are on lost okay, income. Let me, yeah, let me see if I'm still sharing. Yeah, we can 
Yes, okay. that's okay. Uh, so they're going to the national survey of uh, home hemo programs uh, in Canada and showing that the majority of programs do partially reimburse patients' uh, expenses for the plumbing and electrical renovations. Uh, so that was about 90% of the programs. Um, and um, I don't know if my slides are still advancing, though, actually. Can you see? Um, yeah, so, so what about ongoing costs to increase utilities? Um, there is this uh, utility grant uh, that is um, uh, present for patients in Ontario. So if they uh, are on home hemo and in Ontario, uh, the, the government will also reimburse uh, for uh, utility costs. So that's also very important uh, to consider uh, for our patients. In addition to those two considerations, um, from a patient perspective, uh, we have to also consider that any increased cost can also be balanced against uh, potential for savings. So patients might have reduced uh, gas or parking costs. Uh, they may have less lost income if they're able to return to work or be uh, more productive at work uh, with regards to um, being off of in-center hemo. And there can be other intangible benefits such as quality of life and uh, health outcomes. And uh, from a systems perspective, again, from, from this uh, report, uh, direct quote, is that any upfront uh, coverage of out-of-pocket costs uh, can still result in a net savings for the healthcare system and for the patient. So there is a, there is a way for this to be a win-win situation. Um, so bottom line for economic evidence, we do see that there's higher startup costs uh, for home hemo as opposed to in-center hemo, uh, but cost savings can be realized uh, with time, uh, given the, the savings that we do see on a year-to-year -year basis. And consideration of any burden or benefit uh, has to also factor in patient experience and, and their own costs. Uh, and so finally, talking about the patient perspective, um, there was this uh, very small study that was published um, about 10 patients uh, that were self-selecting prevalent hemo patients uh, started on in-center nocturnal um, dialysis and looking at their quality of life uh, at enrollment and four months later. Um, and the results of this was that they did see some improvement uh, to this visual analog score, the EQ5D, as well as the uh, anxiety score. Um, so here is some of the uh, primary data uh, from that study. And so there was significant improvement to, uh, to those two scores. Very small study, of course, so it's quite limited. Uh, and so leading to perhaps uh, the need for uh, better quality evidence, such as this, this systematic review that uh, came out in 2015. Uh, this looked at 220 patients, uh, of which 110 were on uh, home hemo. Uh, it was a systematic review of qualitative studies. So a little bit less of those hard uh, numbers that we're used to looking at, but more so uh, trying to synthesize a variety of themes. Um, and they identified uh, five main themes uh, that patients thought were very important uh, in their dialysis care. Um, the vulnerability of dialyzing independently if they were at home and the fear of being alone. The concern that the burden would shift from perhaps the, the nurses in the hospital to the family. Uh, their opportunity to thrive and uh, their ability to uh, receive um, medical services in a timely and responsive manner. And uh, delving more into their opportunity to thrive, uh, patients really uh, emphasized that they uh, wanted to have uh, a healthy self-identity, uh, the ability to gain their own control and freedom, to have a sense of normality, to be able to strengthen relationships with uh, their loved ones, uh, and to have ownership of their decision. And so these are, are themes that we can't quantify, but are, are very important to consider uh, and uh, as depicted in, in this um, word map. Um, and uh, this group uh, with uh, the senior author of Dr. Sood again, uh, had looked at some of these uh, patient reported outcome measures and quality of life uh, by dialysis modality. Uh, and there was a direct comparison of home hemo versus in center, uh, looking at two randomized control trials and nine prospective cohort studies. Uh, and they did find significant differences favoring home hemo uh, in the quality of life domains of general health, burden of kidney disease, and that uh, aforementioned uh, visual analog score. Um, the study did come out after, um, sorry, this study had come out uh, after that uh, the prior study, um, looking at uh, a randomized trial of extending hemodialysis hours and quality of life. Um, we had briefly talked about this one before. It had looked at 200 adult recipients uh, doing uh, home-based hemo versus uh, standard. Uh, and this particular study had not found a difference. And so perhaps looking at the accumulation of data, there, there might be a signal towards a difference, but this particular randomized study had not found one. 
bottom line for patient experience is that uh, the preference for a patient specific modality can really vary according to individual circumstances. And what's really important to patients is that uh, a treatment is least disruptive to their lives and to their caregivers' lives. Uh, for some patients, that might mean home-based dialysis. For others, that might mean in-center. Um, but having information about the treatment options and being involved in their decision-making really helps make patients feel empowered. And so that leads us to uh, the final main section, which is uh, some barriers and challenges that we uh, can encounter when discussing home hemo. Uh, patient factors is, is a big one, and uh, it's it's similar to what we've talked about in, in the last uh, section. So that uh, lack of interest, lack of confidence, and fear of failure or social isolation, uh, a feeling of dependence on the help uh, that can be provided on in-center hemo, or something as simple as uh, needophobia and fear of having their, their home medicalized if a dialysis machine is there. Uh, and so uh, patient education can be a vital um, way in which this can be mitigated. Uh, integration and de default education when discussing uh, KRT modalities in MCK clinic or any time when a patient is transitioning uh, can be very uh, important. Uh, there was a study published, uh, it's now maybe 18 years ago, uh, but in the US, 90% of patients were not presented with home hemo. It's a modality choice when receiving education. Um, I'm not sure if there's any uh, similar Canadian data, I couldn't find any, uh, but I thought that was that was really striking. Of course, we do know that the U.S. has a much lower prevalence rate uh, than we do. Um, with regards to mitigating patient factors, uh, in a Canadian trial, uh, there were 70 patients uh, with uh, low GFR that were randomized to just the standard education versus a multifaceted educational intervention uh, with nurses, social work, MD, et cetera. Patients uh, who had received the intervention were more likely to perceive the advantages of home hemo. And even in the setting of unplanned urgent start dialysis, having a comprehensive education program can lead to a successful transition eventually to a home modality instead of continuing on uh, for in-center. So some strategies that might uh, help to overcome this uh, could be meeting other home uh, dialysis patients and their families, uh, the ability to practice self cannulation or machine setup, uh, and uh, just being uh, informed of these options. Uh, I chatted with Natalie Patterson actually just to see what we do here at TOH, and I was encouraged actually that we do discuss uh, the advantages and considerations of home hemo. Uh, Natalie talks about uh, home assessment, the OR and BRIC grant that we talked about, various types of prescriptions, uh, and the commitment of training and type of support. Uh, so that certainly was uh, was good to know. Uh, that these types of um, of information are provided to our patients uh, here at TOH, um, but of course that is uh, provided only if they do receive uh, this formal options education. Um, so what about safety? P patients really want to know, you know, if I'm dialyzing at home, is it safe? What is the risk of adverse events, etc.? Uh, and so this was a retrospective cohort study uh, done out of. Um, uh, TGH in Toronto, uh, looking at 202 patients uh, that were on uh, home hemo, a total of 757 patient years, and a median dialysis of uh, five dialysis treatments per week. Um, and they found that there was, over that period of time, 22 adverse events and um, seven recurrent uh, events. Uh, so the event rates per thousand dialysis treatments uh, were 0 0.208, 0 0.068, and 0 0.087 uh, for uh, AVF, AVG, and uh, otherwise catheter access issues, uh, respectively. So really talking about um, less than one in a thousand or one in 10,000 uh, odds of uh, adverse event with regards to the uh, access. Uh, and the uh, the rates of severe adverse events, so not just an access issue, but uh, severe exsanguination or air embolism, et cetera, uh, was at a rate of 0 0.009 uh, patient years, um, so certainly very low. And so this depicts some of the uh, errors that, that did happen uh, in this study. So needle dislodgement and air embolism were uh, two of the, the larger ones, but of course happening at a very infrequent rate. Um, and so we can see that the number of treatments to have one event uh, approaches 10,000, 30,000, 50,000. So certainly very, very low event rate. Um, and there is a, an additional study that uh, supported this uh, that was published um, more uh, around the same time, I believe, uh, looking at 190 patients. Um, and uh, they found similar findings. Um, so this one was entitled Catastrophic Events in Home Hemo. And uh, similarly, it found that uh, the event rate was was very low, and oftentimes 
uh, it could eventually by root cause analysis uh, be traced back to uh, human error. Uh, so patients that might have improperly clamped the machine, uh, ignored patient alarms, et cetera, uh, leading to some degree of, of blood loss. Uh, and there was, there was one death uh, through uh, the total amount of follow-up. Um, so certainly uh, that data does support the fact that the event rate uh, for adverse events is, is quite low. Uh, patients do also really want to know about technique failure. Uh, and uh, this was um, in AJKD in 2019, uh, looking at unadjusted one to two year technique survival and overall survival, finding these to be uh, in the range of about uh, 90 to 94% for technique and then 83 to 87% for overall. Uh, and I thought this study was interesting because treating center here was a strong predictor of uh, technique failure and uh, mortality. Uh, and with baseline adjustment, for center, uh, they actually found that uh, only older age or more than three treatments per week uh, predicted technique failure. Um, so here's uh, the, uh, the data from the study. Uh, so we can see that one of the centers uh, was certainly an outlier. The uh, center number four was uh, considered the reference center. Uh, and we can see that uh, there was one outlier, but most of them did seem to be uh, kind of having a hazard ratio uh, in the range of about one. Uh, and finally, what about equity, uh, which is also another barrier that might need to be overcome when considering this. Um, in a national survey, half of the home hemo programs um, required a care partner just by institutional policy uh, to be with a patient when they dialyzed. Uh, the majority of these people are unpaid family members or living companions, and it really does raise the issue of equity for patients who don't have a care partner uh, but might want access to this type of therapy. Uh, there are a variety of complex systemic factors, structural incentives, and availability of services uh, that can be offered to patients. Uh, that is also a complicating factor. And uh, informed consent for these patients really is uh, ensuring that they have uh, access to accurate, unbiased information of all available options. And it's one of the important uh, medical principles uh, that we have. Um, but bottom line wise is that we do have to be uh, very sure towards uh, supporting uh, patients in their choice uh, when considering these types of modalities. Um, and so there are, this is just a summary of uh, the different types of barriers that can be faced. Uh, so it can be from the patient side, uh, from the provider side, if the providers have insufficient knowledge of uh, advantages or disadvantages for home hemo, and also government policy and uh, we've talked a little bit about uh, the ORN and uh, other institutional policy, but uh, funding and reimbursement policies can, of course, uh, be either a barrier or a way to overcome a barrier uh, for these types of uh, modalities. And so wrapping up in these last few minutes, um, do we have any potential solutions? Um, this is a slide that uh, I've copied to uh, to later on, so it's it's a lot of words, and certainly I think we can uh, address this as I foresee a lot of the questions might pertain to this. Um, but uh, there are a bunch of barriers and many potential solutions uh, that can be uh, derived, and I would defer going over this slide. Uh, there's um, a bunch of different um, systematic approaches uh, that can be employed uh, as well for promotion of home hemo. Um, this is from uh, one of the papers uh, that uh, Dr. Chan at the University of Toronto has uh, published, uh, just on the type of structural uh, changes that we can have in our dialysis units uh, that might lead to patients being uh, more perceptive towards the advantages of home hemo. So integrating it uh, perhaps in um, having some uh, stations in our dialysis units where patients are transitioning uh, between modalities uh, and having this transitional care unit alongside patients who might be uh, having a uh, kind of permanent chronic in center uh, can be a very valuable way in which patients can receive the support that they need as they transition towards the home. Who are the best candidates? Sometimes it seems like they might be unicorns that don't really exist, uh, but uh, overall I would say that interested patients placing a high value on independence and control, the ability to work, and the, uh, the need to customize their prescription according to their lifestyle and have that freedom uh, is uh, are very important patients to consider. Um, and so uh, they also have to have the appropriate home setting and uh, family support. There are a variety of tools that can be used. This one isn't meant to be used as a total checklist, but just some red flags or green flags that might mean that patients are um, very bad or very good candidates for home hemo. Um, but one of the 
questions that uh, can be very simply used uh, to see if the patients are able to conceptualize, problem solve, and multitask uh, at the level that they need to do home hemo. It's actually just to ask if they can drive a car. Um, so uh, perhaps a controversial statement, but driving the home dialysis system uh, is arguably safer and easier than driving a car. And so it's, it's a good kind of first screening question. Of course, there's many other questions that need to be asked. Um, if home hemo has all these benefits, why is the uptake so low? It could be clinical inertia, financial incentivization, or even just a self-fulfilling prophecy in that we might be lacking really good randomized control level data. Um, but with this ongoing low prevalence of home hemo patients, it can be that we will struggle to continue to have robust data into the future. And organizing large RCTs is, is very challenging. Uh, because of the equipoise of treatment selection, but also patient values and preferences when forcing them to be randomized uh, to a different uh, treatment uh, type than they might want. And so in my uh, final words, I just wanted to say that dialysis modality selection really, I, I think, should be about patients being able to choose their own journey. Uh, it's, there's no best way to get from Ottawa to Toronto. It could be that we take a car, or a train, plane, um, but we have this structure or pathway for PD in which we uh, really try to identify patients who um, might be uh, eligible and offer it uh, to them and have them ultimately choose PD. Um, but I wonder if we can have a similar approach uh, to home hemo. And there are specific scenarios uh, where uh, home hemo uh, may be especially warranted. Uh, that we can certainly talk about uh, as we move into uh, our discussion section. Um, so this was also meant to be uh, deferred to the question section. Um, so my final slide is that home dialysis is not just PD. Home hemo is a reasonably cost-effective method to provide KRT in the home. It's associated with several clinical benefits, uh, which we've demonstrated. Studies are challenged by selection bias, uh, but it has to be considered in patients who are fit enough uh, for the modality. And ongoing questions uh, do exist on how to improve education for patients, healthcare providers, and uh, overcoming many of those barriers uh, and obstacles. Um, we consider pati if patients are transplant candidates regularly, but in this area of patient-centered care, should we be doing the same for home hemo? Um, you may call me a dreamer here, um, but I will be pursuing the stream uh, moving forward at uh, the University Health Network in Toronto next year. Uh, and uh, that uh, concludes my presentation. Uh, here are the references, and uh, I just have uh, a lot of thanks uh, to everybody at Seven Northwest, Dallas's units, and the Riverside Clinics. Some special thanks uh, to Dr. Hesketh as the program director, uh, Drs. Hor, Biani, and Magner for being the fellows, uh, longitudinal clinic supervisors, uh, Dr. McCormick for significant uh, mentorship and help, Dr. Clark for research mentorship and help as well. Dr. Hiramath uh, for this opportunity, Dr. Zimmerman for chatting with me about home hemo, uh, Kim, my admin, Dr. Edwards uh, and Melanie for longitudinal dialysis support, and Natalie Patterson for speaking with me about uh, options education here at TOH, and of course, all my co-fellows for their uh, support and, uh, and help. Uh, so with that, that uh, concludes uh, my presentation. I'm happy to take uh, any questions uh, that uh, you may have. Awesome. Thank you for that uh, excellent uh, and thorough overview of the topic. Um, oh, there are some questions already. Sumaya, please go ahead and mute yourself. Actually, it's it's me. Can you hear me? Oh, sure. Yes, Yolanda. Okay. Um, so one comment and then a question. So um, when I was a fellow at McGill, they had a six station unit um, that was supervised by one nurse where patients did kind of self-care in-center uh, hemodialysis and set up their own machine and they could, some of them needle, some of them didn't um, sort of thing. So I guess one question is, you know, is that a bridge potentially uh, to um, home uh, hemo? Uh, and then the other question would be, um, given the startup costs, you know, in terms of machine training, all that, uh, is this a reasonable modality for people who are potentially going to get a transplant within a year or two? Yeah, both really good questions. Um, I, I totally agree. And I think uh, as depicted in the um, in the graphical schematic where there are the four different types of transitional units, I think that is a really good way for patients to be able to see um, that there are other patients receiving in center, but also have the, the support of uh, nurses and other resources that they might need. Um, I do wonder, I, I don't think we have a similar type of structure here in Ottawa, but I, I wonder if uh, it would be feasible to have uh, such a structural type of um, change here. Uh, 
Um, and your, your second question about yeah, the startup cost of 11,400 in the first year is certainly well taken. I, I think it has to be considered when uh, doing kind of modality selection and uh, a shared decision making uh, with the patients uh, at the time, whether they're an MCK uh, or on dialysis otherwise. Um, if it seems like they're going to be you know, they're, they're a type A, they might be off the list in a year or two, then it might not be worth going through the hassle of having their home retrofitted uh, and, and such. Uh, but I think if it seems like they will be on dialysis uh, for a very long term, as, as many of our patients are, or if their weight on the transplant list would exceed two years, uh, then I certainly think it's, it's a more worthwhile consideration. And I think it, it's a case by case basis. Thanks for the questions, though. Excellent. Uh, Manish, you had a question as well. Ryan, that was really, really good. I, I found that, you know, you did a really nice summary. I apologize I was a little late. Uh, a couple of comments. One that I thought was uh, illustrated was how uh, Canada dominant this data is. If you look, it's like a history of Canadian nephrology as you go through it. And Canada has always been a huge leader in this area. And it's nice to see that you're going to continue on with our friend Chris Chan uh, in Toronto in this area. Um, I'll put out a controversial statement for fun, uh, uh, knowing that the costs are the way they are and outcome data is unclear and maybe will never be in a randomized fashion available. Uh, should we assume a PD first home dialysis first strategy as some countries in the world have, uh, such as Hong Kong or Taiwan? Certainly a very controversial statement. I think that, um, I don't know if the recording is on, but um, you know, I, I, I do think that um, the, the reality of, uh, of the, the way in which our funding for our healthcare system is, is structured is that we, we have to try to do what is best for the majority of patients, uh, while also being cognizant that if we had every center on, for example, if, if every patient were to start within center hemo, uh, that the cost could be insurmountable and, and could uh, lead to kind of taking away money from other uh, areas of need within our healthcare system, whether it's mental health or cardiology or whatnot. So I, I think that uh, the, the push, the public push towards uh, trying to increase funding towards home modalities really tries to strike that balance of uh, having a reasonable amount of cost, uh, but also uh, with an emphasis on trying to have uh, patients uh, being able to achieve that freedom and independence uh, that is really important to them and as demonstrated in some of the, the qualitative data. Um, so I, I think, you know, for the cost is just one piece. I think that the clinical outcomes and the patient experiences piece has to be factored in as well. But certainly I, I think that uh, people that are uh, administrators and higher uh, kind of level of government than, than I am would be uh, more well-versed and trained uh, to answer that one. But thank you for that question, Dr. Sue. I know Peter wants to say something about cost, but first I'll let Brendan ask his question. Uh, if you want to continue along the cost line, that's fine with me. I, I was going to ask about technology. No. Um, so, so my question has to do with you know, uh, you know, 20 years ago when when I was a fellow, that the hope was the technology was was actually going to was going to allow home hemo to really break through out of that kind of, you know, three to five percent uh, prevalence. Um, and and we're talking less and less about home hemodialysis technology now. There, there was a, previously a lot of excitement about some startup uh, companies. Uh, Baxter had had a had a big uh, interest for a while in a new home hemo machine that they didn't uh, end up bringing to market. Um, Fresenius, as, as, as you probably know now, owns Next Stage, and they have brought uh, an updated uh, version of the Next Stage. I'm not sure if it's licensed in Canada yet. Um, but my my question is: Do, do you still think that, uh, or do you, do you think that 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 there really is any prospect that we're going to have a technologic breakthrough that just makes this easy enough that we can expand the eligibility to? People who maybe otherwise couldn't uh, couldn't do it, or or are we best to kind of uh, focus on the things that, that that you've mentioned, work with the the resources that we have, and and uh, work on education and encouraging people uh, to to choose this. Based on my review of the literature, I, I I do not I'm not super optimistic for for a major uh, uh, technological breakthrough. Uh, 
Um, I had chatted with uh, Dr. Chan when I was on elective last October as well, and I think he had mentioned that there was there was some um, processing through Health Canada for that uh, that prototype next uh, stage machine that you had mentioned, uh, Dr. McCormick. But as far as I know, I don't think it's received approval, uh, and so. Even if it did, I, I don't know if it would be so like groundbreaking that uh, that everybody would certainly be eligible kind of to a to a such a different level that it would be it would change the needle. So I I, I think that uh, that focusing on some of the the other barriers might be uh, might be a uh, better uh, use of energies. <laughs> Thanks. So before I I call upon Peter, I would like to push back against uh, uh, Manish's controversial point. You know, you've clearly shown that uh, home hemo is more expensive. Uh, if you look at the RCTs, uh, they are all negative. Active showed there's no difference in quality of life. Uh, FHN shows there's no difference in outcomes. Um, the observational data is horribly uh, um, biased because of selection, right? Look at the patients who are on home hemo in Ottawa versus the patients who are on in center. Uh, and who cares if the numbers are better, if the outcomes are not better? So I would push back and say, you know, we should not be pushing for more home hemo. It's just increasing cost. Uh, maybe we are at a happy um, uh, balance. Uh, uh, and you know, you're just going to, and, and your reply to Manish was quite appropriate that you know we have to balance uh, where we are spending the money. Uh, why pour good money uh, in doing something which has questionable uh, clinical benefit? Um, and it's not really a question. It was more of a comment. So I let uh, Peter jump in now. Uh, we'll comment on the money and then go on to my real <laughs> comment. Uh, home hemo is clearly cheaper because in Canada, the big cost of in-center dialysis is nurses and you don't have them at home. If you start paying helpers to go home, then it's not cheaper anymore. Um, and with respect to technology, Brendan brought up the uh, question of could we expand the potential pool of people who could do it to a way larger pool? Well, currently, I bet you about 50% of people could do home hemo. And our problem is failure of recruitment of those people to home for all the reasons that Ryan mentioned. And I'd suggest that we really should be stopping using the word education, because if you present people with uh, these are the options, uh, pick whatever you want. Well, we don't do that in any other kind of medicine. We make recommendations. And so I think the term we should use is decision support. And the places that are really successful in recruitment have active decision support. We had uh, uh, the nurse educator from UHN visit us 10 years ago, and she was a remarkable person. And very clearly, she didn't just present, these are the facts you choose. And I think we have a failure of that sort of uh, you know, not arm twisting, but of at least sort of discussing why you might choose, you know, and I think maybe we should do more of what you you briefly flashed past that Australia, New Zealand thing that lines up the factors that might uh, influence patient choice. I think we should do more of those decision aid kind of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think a big thing is that here in, in Canada, a lot of centers, we do consider in-center hemo to be kind of the default. And then once we have that clinical inertia and the momentum of them on in-center, then it's, it becomes challenging to change the course. And so I wonder if the, the question really should be like, is this patient a candidate to eventually go home and how do we get them home? Similar to how we discharge plan otherwise. Um, but uh, that's that does lead to certain other challenges and and more work to figure out what kind of supports they have at home. And I do think that in, in MCK, we do try to push home first, but for sure it's PD because that seems to be easier and everybody gets daunted at the idea of the length of training and the machine, et cetera. And I think we do not push home demo enough. Um, so I'll stop there. And Swap, no, I think you had the numbers back to front. Home dialysis is way cheaper than in center, so it's not sinking more money into this. It depends on how you look at it. If you look at the CADET report, it's compared to in center hemodialysis. Um, uh, you look at how the numbers are being calculated, and, and again, from a societal perspective, you are pushing the labor cost onto the patient, which you are not taking into account. 
uh, from a healthcare perspective, sure, it's cheaper, uh, but the labor cost is just not calculated there. Um, but let's not, you know, we can carry on our conversation offline. I think Tamara had one last question, so we'll let her ask that before we conclude. You're muted, Tamara. Oh, sorry about that. Um, I was going to say this also touches on money to an extent. I was thinking of Ryan's point about the loss of income when people start home hemodialysis. Um, and then for those who don't necessarily own their homes, are there, rather than obligations, but are there incentives for landlords to support people who are considering home hemodialysis um, to, to do so in, in environments that they don't actually own themselves? Yeah, very good question. Um, and so in that survey of the um, home hemo programs, 90% uh, of the um, of the programs would pay for the, um, the change, whether the patient owns the home or not, uh, the change to the water supply and uh, plumbing, et cetera, and electricity. And if there need to, needed to be reversal, all the costs for renovations would, would also be covered. Um, so that is that is part of the startup costs, but it's uh, often reimbursed uh, by the programs, except for in 10% of the Canadian programs. Fantastic. And we are just over nine. That was a really nice discussion. Uh, thanks, Ryan, for that uh, really thorough overview of home hemodialysis uh, and for uh, fielding all uh, the hard questions from the audience. Uh, good luck on your fellowship and congratulations. Thank you. Appreciate everybody's support once again.